I want to hand over now to our last speaker. Please, to the others, all stay online. Uh, it's Francesca Racioppi. Um, I'm happy that you, are, you will talk here uh, on the next topic, and you are the head of the European Center for Environment and Health in Bonn of the World Health Organization since 2018. And um, you started there in 2004 already and have been in uh, many different um, uh, parts of WHO, like Rome and Copenhagen. And uh, you have experience, more than 30 years of experience, international experience in environmental and health policies. Your, spe uh, your specific interest is um, in health and all policies, health impact assessment, um, in active mobility policies and in consumer safety. And in 2018, you were awarded as honorary doctorate by the Swedish School of Sport and Health Science in Stockholm, Sweden. So the floor is yours. We are looking forward on what the WHO um, has to say. Thanks. Hello, good afternoon. I hope you can hear me loud and clear, and many thanks for your introduction. Greetings from Bonn, where the European Center for Environment and Health is located. So I will now start sharing uh, my screen, and we are on with this presentation. Um, First of all, um, I would like uh, uh, to, to thank the previous speakers because you have been uh, touching upon already so many of the challenges that we face when we think of human biomonitoring. And uh, um, my presentation, for which I'm grateful to my co-authors, Dr. Jarosinska and uh, uh, Dr. Zastenskaya, is really going to look at some of these dimensions and in particular at the science policy interface. So where is human biomonitoring sitting when we, we look at the science policy interface? So I will, uh, um, I will uh, uh, then uh, um, progress in this presentation if this allows me um, to move forward. Oh, oh. This is now. Oh, sorry. For some reason, this is uh, this seems to be uh, blocking. Just a second. I will stop sharing for a second and try to to see what is going on here. Um, Yeah. Okay. Um, so this this uh, short presentation will be about the role of human biomonitoring for public health. Um, I will position that vis-a-vis -vis the policy framework which exists for that, and then I will draw um, from some example of our involvement as a WHO in human biomonitoring activities. Um, from which we have been deriving some uh, lessons and priorities for the future. And finally, I will uh, identify some opportunities for uh, um, collaboration. Um, and this is, there is a something strange with uh, when I'm trying to, to, to move on with this. So I think I will, uh, uh, in the interest of time, I will continue uh, my presentation without the slides. Um, yeah, I'm really sorry, I cannot fix this right now. Okay. So, okay, so I'm here. Back. Um, and now this is moving again. Uh, so it's uh, okay. I, I, I'm grateful to the speak to the technicians because you were able to get started with the, the backup presentation that we sent. This is great. So why is uh, what is the place of human biomonitoring for public health? We all know that it is a method for assessing exposure. Uh, 
and health risks so that we can promote risk reduction measures and we can go about it. From a policy perspective, uh, this uh, falls within uh, global and regional policies. And this is uh, very important because it is linked to the commitment, the political commitment of the member states to promote and to utilize and to further develop methodologies for human biomonitoring. So in 2017, the World Health Assembly, which is the gathering of all the ministries of health who are members of the World Health Organization, adopted the WHO Chemical Roadmap for, um, uh, for Knowledge and Evidence, being one of its main uh, activities areas. And this is very important because within the chemicals roadmap, we also uh, identify risk assessment, biomonitoring and surveillance as uh, um, one of the key action areas where we um, and the member states are working together to foster progress and particularly filling up in scientific knowledge, development of globally harmonized methods and tools, and working towards uh, integrating health and environmental monitoring and investigating the links between exposures and health impact at the community level. At the same time, in Europe, in the European region, our 53 member states have identified Francesca? human biomonitoring. Excuse me? Yes. Um, Yes. May I interrupt you for a moment? Maybe we have yes, a problem please. with the slides. Um, we can go on with the slides for you here. It's now slide three. Is it the one you are talking about? Yes, 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 yes. And I will advance you, and I will tell you how to move, when to move to the next. Yes. Okay, it's still and I'm really happy slide that I sent so you a backup copy. It doesn't matter. Just, ju yeah. just tell us when you need the next slide. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. And, um, and also in Europe, uh, the 53 member states of the European region of the WHO have uh, um, placed the biomonitoring uh, uh, as one of the elements that they recognize and must be acted upon as a, as a matter of priority as they try to push forward the, uh, the European agenda for environment and health. Um, the next slide, please. So if we look at the different reasons why human biomonitoring is important for public health, we can list very many of them. I will not be able to, to, to delve into each and every one of them. I will rather focus, uh, next slide please, on three of them. Um, and particularly, I will illustrate how we have been using in the WHO work uh, on biomonitoring to support accumulation of scientific knowledge and the promotion of research, identifying population at risks, promoting the policy decisions and monitor their effectiveness, and then also looking at the social economic impact of policy actions. So these are the examples that uh, I've decided to select for this afternoon. The next slide, please. I will start with something which is uh, uh, quite known to, I believe, many of you. Since 1987, WHO and UNEP have been running a global survey of persistent organic pollutants in breast milk. And this is a major undertaking. Since uh, 1987, we have gone uh, through six rounds. Uh, the last one, uh, uh, the sixth one was uh, uh, ran from 2012 and 2015. And throughout the process, uh, we have been uh, having uh, uh, 43 member states who have participated in different uh, um, uh, issues of this, uh, uh, of this survey. What is, why is this survey of particular importance? It has been of a great importance because it has allowed us to apply common methodology across uh, different uh, countries. And this is, as we have uh, the previous speakers have highlighted, of huge significant and importance. It has allowed us to identify some populations at risk. So for example, a finding that was quite uh, surprising in the last edition was, uh, uh, was to find a, a particularly high level of, uh, um, uh, of POPs in, uh, uh, in a human uh, milk 
from populations in Africa where, without having a clear understanding of where this exposure was, uh, was, was, was coming from. So it, it allows us to identify some populations at risk and then start investigating uh, uh, what is happening there. But the other aspect that it also allows to do, particularly for the countries who have been participating in different rounds, is uh, to see how the situation uh, is, uh, is monitoring. And some key lessons that we have learned through, through this exercise is that, uh, of course, there is a huge value in being able to, to produce a reliable and comparable data. But at the same time, we also recognize that the development of national laboratory capacities is equally important. The, 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 the first speaker of this session has highlighted how few are the laboratories that uh, do have capacities to uh, undertake human biomonitoring and support the human biomonitoring studies. The other aspect that comes uh, across very clearly is that the countries offer very significant, they, um, they are very different uh, when it comes uh, to experience and possibility to implement human biomonitoring because of policy, because of human resources or because of technical resources. And again, these points to the paramount need and, uh, and value of international partnerships. And what we are doing today with this uh, human, uh, with this uh, conference and this uh, major undertaking that uh, um, the human biomonitoring for Europe uh, represents is a, a great example of exactly this uh, moving together in partnership. The next slide, please. Another example that uh, uh, we believe is of interest is to see how human biomonitoring contributes to the promotion of policy decisions and to monitor their effectiveness. This example comes from uh, uh, the, the application of human biomonitoring in the context of the Minamata Convention on Mercury. As you know, this is the last and extremely important uh, um, legally binding instrument that has been negotiated by the member states. Here, at least five articles in the, in the convention have, uh, um, have a link and benefit from human biomonitoring. And I have to say that from the WHO perspective, I'm particularly proud that uh, it has been our office, the European Center for Environment and Health, um, which has been uh, able to, to, to contribute uh, to um, the, uh, the global uh, mercury monitoring plan, which is uh, currently being discussed in terms of the evaluation of the convention uh, effectiveness. So we see a, a direct uh, impact and a direct input of human biomonitoring into legally binding instruments. So um, from this application, we have learned that, uh, um, again, the methodological support in terms of standard operating procedures and protocols is a paramount. But on top of this, we also need the training of national coordinators and we need capacity in field, field staff and laboratory workers. And again, if we are thinking of expanding these instruments, clearly partnerships in this area, training of, um, um, of, Francesca, uh, of experts. Francesca, excuse me. Francesca? Yes? Unfortunately, yes. time is running out. Just yes. maybe hurry and up. I'm, and I'm very Thank close very to, to finish. Yes. So if I can have the last, could I please have the next slide? Yes. This is about another classic example. And this comes from children exposure to lead from paints and the prohibition of lead in paints. And this tells us a lot about the difficulty First of, you know, establishing, but also interpreting and living with the, the so-called um, uh, reference values for lead, we have them. Uh, it is uh, recognized um, at the five uh, micrograms per deciliter of blood uh, level. But we also know that below those levels, there are still effects which are reported, particularly in terms of reduction in, um, in IQ. And again, this tells us about Francesca, the difficulty of using and I'm so sorry, but yes? we have to stop here.
can we skip maybe yeah. uh, the, the next slide so that you can come to an end? I'm yeah. very sorry, but we have okay. to stop here if now. If you can move to the to the second one. Okay, so this is um, this will uh, um, I, I'm touching upon the priorities. Um, we need to fill gaps in scientific knowledge. We need to promote the policy decision in human biomonitoring as an instrument for policy making, and I've illustrated some examples of that. And we have to continue strengthening the involvement of the health sector here. Um, for that, we need the partnerships. So we believe that the continuing with the existing partnerships and capitalizing on the one represented by the uh, EU uh, for Europe uh, human biomonitoring project is a great opportunity. And as a WHO, we will be very happy to promote uh, uh, its finding and to utilize them and bringing them across the European region, but also globally. Um, I will uh, stop here. Sorry for the technical glitch that uh, made us uh, wasting a little bit of time. And many thanks for your patience and congratulations for the excellent technical support. <laughs>